The material in this presentation is based on the DBRS Morningstar criteria, preferred share and hybrid security criteria for corporate issuers, dated October 21, 2021. Today's focus is on hybrid securities, which have been issued with more fre frequency recently than preferred shares. Please prefer, refer to the criteria for DBRS Morningstar's treatment of preferred shares. The presentation will follow the format noted in this slide. I will start with a, an introduction, discuss how ratings are assigned to hybrid securities, discuss the determination of equity treatment for hybrid securities, and finally conclude with three case studies to illustrate the points. The criteria is applied mainly to corporate issuers, while the equity weightings may also apply to non-bank financial institutions. Companies issue hybrid securities largely because they attract a degree of equity treatment from rating agencies without diluting the ownership interests of their common shares. As well, debt treatment is re received from tax authorities, whereby the associated interest expense is deductible for income tax purposes. Investors buy hybrid securities largely due to the higher interest coupon combined with relatively smaller incremental credit risk relative to senior unsecured debt for investment grade issuers. DBRS Morningstar assigns equity weightings to hybrid securities ranging from 0% to 100% based on their equity-like characteristics. Currently, the most common equity weighting for hybrid securities is 50%, which will be illustrated later in a case study. DBRS Morningstar's two-stage process combines primary and additional factors to determine the equity weighting. Note that DBRS Morningstar caps the combined equity treatment assigned to preferred shares and hybrid securities to 10% of total capital. This will also be illustrated later in a case study for clarity. The hybrid security equity weightings are used by DBRS Morningstar to adjust debt and equity levels in its leverage metrics calculations, such as debt to EBITDA, cash flow to debt, and debt to capital. However, in the vast majority of cases, the interest expense of hybrid security is not adjusted in calculating coverage ratios, such as EBITDA interest coverage, until an issuer decides to exercise its deferral rights under the instrument. DBRS Morningstar expects the interest expense of the hybrid securities to be paid. DBRS Morningstar believes that all interest expense that is paid should be captured in its interest coverage ratios regardless of whether it's senior unsecured or hybrid interest. When determining the equity weighting of a hybrid security, its characteristics are measured against the attributes of common equity, which of course is treated as 100% equity, which include one, subordination to all other creditors, Two, permanence in the capital structure, that is no maturity date. Three, ability to miss scheduled payments, in this case common dividends, without causing a default or cross default to debt instruments. These principles are the under underpinnings for determining the equity weightings of hybrid securities. Most hybrid securities are deeply subordinated and are typically rated two notches below the issuer rating. Additional notches of rating separation may be applied to reflect the presence of different ranking classes of subordinated debt, although such cases are typically rare. Note that if an issuer decline, declares an interest deferral event, the holder of the hybrid security would have no choice but to wait for an extended period of time to receive its interest payments. After the deferral period is over, the hybrid security interest expense is due and payable failure to pay would then be an event of default. The 
The table on this slide summarizes the primary characteristics used by DBRS Morningstar to assign equity treatment to hybrid securities. As you can tell from this chart, no equity treatment will be assigned if the hybrid security is not subordinated to senior unsecured debt. No equity treatment will be assigned if the assumed remaining term to maturity, as determined by DBRS Morningstar, is less than five years. And no equity treatment will be assigned if there is no ability for the issuer to defer sec hybrid security interest payments for at least two years. This slide summarizes the primary considerations for any equity treatment to be attributed to a hybrid security. Note the, that the assumed remaining term to maturity as determined by DBRS Morningstar is typically the critical factor in determining the equity weighting of a hybrid security. Hybrid securities are typically, are typically structured with an issuer optional redemption feature at year 10, otherwise known as a non-call 10, although non-call fives have also been issued in the past and continue to be. The issuer's intention to replace the hybrid security upon early redemption with an instrument with equal or greater equity treatment than the original hybrid is critical in order for the assumed remaining term to maturity to move beyond the first call date. Again, a case study will follow later in this session to illustrate the concepts. The additional considerations listed on this slide, if deemed material, are incorporated into the final equity weighting analysis. These factors can be important for, in certain cases, for subordinated debt instruments qualifying for 100% equity treatment, which is not the focus of this session, but is included here for completeness. Back one slide on that. Slide 11. Similar to the previous slide, the additional considerations listed on this slide, if deemed material, are incorporated into the final equity weighting analysis. Any provisions that delay an issuer's ability to, to defer interest payments on a hybrid security are viewed negatively in determining its equity weighting. Convertible subordinated bonds typically do not meet the minimum two-year interest deferability requirement nor the greater than five year assumed maturity, remaining term to maturity threshold to receive equity treatment. Before I move on to the next section with the case studies, uh, if you have any questions it would be, uh, that you would like to answer uh, answered right now, please, please feel free to ask the question in the box under your screen. Otherwise, I will proceed to the case studies. Okay, so let's go through the first case study. Essentially, this is issuer A was just issued recently a 60-year instrument nominally fixed to fixed floating subordinated notes due February 10th, 2082, issued February 10th, 2022, which received 50% equity treatment. Now, these, these are all hypothetical cases, but just uh, for the interest of illustrating the points. So this case study demonstrates the application of the primary considerations used by DBRS Morningstar to determine the equity treatment assigned to a particular instrument. The first component, of course, is subordination. As we noted before, if there is no subordination, there is no equity treatment. So in this case, we're confirming that the required subordination feature is in place. After confirming that, the assumed remaining term to maturity is determined. As indicated previously, that is usually the typical um, component that has a big uh, impact on whether that instrument will get the 50% or 25% equity treatment that uh, is being sought. There's our discussion here about the replacement language. In this case, 
which is typically within the prospectus supplement, is used to determine is used to determine whether the instruments whether the issuer's intention to replace is narrowly defined to a DBRS Morningstar satisfaction or not. So in the first case where there is where it's narrowly defined, the hybrid in security upon early redemption with an instrument with equal or greater equity treatment is expected. And so the test is met of assumed remaining term to maturity exceeding 10 years in this case, given that the optional redemption is at year 10. So we can now look past that first hurdle to see what the next uh, hurdle would be in terms of the maturity date of this instrument. In this case, the assigned maturity is determined to be year 30 when the step in step up in coupon rate reaches a cumulative 1%. Now, DBRS Morningstar will assume that that is the cumulative, that, that the cumulative 1% step up will, will definitely be a, bur a, a hurdle to the company continuing to leave that issuance outstanding. So that's why we end up with year 30 as the case here. The hybrid security also meets the remaining tests listed above and would consequently be afforded the equity treatment noted in the slide. Note that the assumed remaining term to maturity test is measured every time the issuer's credit metrics are calculated. That is why in this case at year 20, with, 20, with 10 years remaining until our assumed maturity, issuer A's hybrid security equity treatment drops from 50% to 25% as there are greater than 10 years remaining term to maturity is no longer met. Similarly, at year 25, with only five years remaining to assume maturity, the equity treatment drops to zero. In case study B, issuer B, we have a very similar instrument, but with one very important difference. After confirming the required subordination feature, the assumed remaining term to maturity is then determined. In this case, we have determined that for issuer B, the replacement language is determined to be not narrowly defined, and the issuer's intention to replace the hybrid instrument upon early redemption with an instrument with equal or greater equity treatment does not meet the, the assumed remaining term to maturity being greater than 10 years. In this case, the assumed maturity is determined to be in year 10, when the first opportunity to call the hybrid security is reached. While the hybrid security meets the remaining tests listed in the slide, the equity treatment is constrained to the levels noted in the slide. That is 25% equity treatment based on the current criteria until February 10th, 2027, that is five years prior to assumed maturity being the first call and 0% until, until the actual maturity, assumed maturity date. Issuer B's hybrid security in this case, it does include an intention to replace, however, it also includes an, a clause whereby it will, it will not replace the instrument if it's comfortable that its issuer rating would not fall below a certain level as a result of the exercise of the optional redemption among other conditions. In this case, DBRS Morningstar does not see this as a level of commitment to replacing the instrument that we did in case with the case of issuer A. So DBRS Morningstar determines that this is a 10-year maturity, which is not greater than 10 years, which is required for the 50%. So 25% is warranted for the first five years and 0% thereafter. Uh, we have a question here in terms of condition, uh, would the contingent step-ups? be included in the 100 basis points cumulative determination, thinking of the scenario where you have the traditional 25 and 75, coupled with some sustainability linked bond like 
dynamics. In theory, those step-ups may never occur if the targets are met so they could be contingent at the time of issue. That is an excellent question. <laughs> As uh, I have reviewed uh, certain uh, stability-linked bonds, and that is true, that in that case, you're going to have a you, you do have a conditional step up as opposed to a as opposed to a step up that's contractual. In that case, it would obviously require determination in advance as the issuance is being done. Um, that would have to take into account the probability that the um, the issuer would meet its targets under that stability sustainability linked bond. So that would be an it, that would be a, de a determination that would have to be made by a rating committee. Uh, and in terms of the, the likelihood of it happening, we would have to evaluate that issuer by issuer. Uh, but it is an excellent question that uh, I believe uh, is challenging to the to that to this particular uh, instrument. Thanks for that question. I will now move on to the to an illustration of our 10% cap on equity treatment. Simple uh, solution here, I guess you can say. So in this case, we are assuming senior debt of $500, hybrid securities of $400, and common equity of $500. We are assuming EBITDA of $250, cash flow of 150 and interest expense of 35, which includes the interest expense on the hybrid securities. In this case, again, the, financial, the assumed financial information is used on the following slides to illustrate the concept. First, the equity treatment of the two tranches of hybrid security must be illustrated, must be assigned as, sorry, as illustrated on this slide. So we determine that the first $200 tranche is viewed as 50% equity. In other words, $100 worth of equity treatment. And with a 20 year assumed remaining term, five year interest deferral and other factors applicable, we get to that 50% equity treatment. The second $200 tranche is viewed as 25% equity treatment, which is $50. In this case, we have a seven year assumed remaining term, three year deferral, and other factors that are acceptable for the 25% equity treatment. So combined the 400 million, sorry, the $400 of hybrids are viewed as $150 of equity and $250 of debt. Then we consider the 10% rule which is that total capital is $1,400. That's as per the previous slide, $500 of senior debt, $400 of hybrid securities, and $500 of common equity for your $1,400. Considering the 10% rule, total capital of $1,400 is multiplied by 10%. So the equity treatment cap in this case is $140. So instead of the $150, that would have been the case if there was no cap. Finally, we have um, the adjusted amounts that we have in terms of determining the credit ratios. So given again that the eligible equities treatment is 150, but the cap is 140, then the $400 of combined hybrids are treated as $140 of equity and $260 of debt. And that is flowed through in terms of calculating the cash flow to debt ratio, the debt to EBITDA ratio, as well as the EBITDA, although the EBITDA coverage is unadjusted because as we noted previously, we do not change the interest expense with respect to the hybrid securities. But also note, that while not demonstrated on this slide, the second tranche of hybrid securities with the 25% equity treatment 
as you'll recall, had only seven years of remaining assumed term to maturity. So let's assume it was a was issued three years ago and it did not meet the replacement language that the PBRS Morningstar uh, looks for. So it has seven years remaining. Now, when we project into the future, assuming that uh, these two hybrids are still there, which we're assuming is the case, that first tranche uh, would still be receiving its 50% equity treatment because it has 18 years of remaining mature, term to maturity. However, the second tranche would now receive zero because it was no longer qualified for any equity treatment as it would have only five years of assumed remaining term to maturity as opposed to the required more than five in order to receive 25% equity treatment. Thank you for your interest in this topic and I would like to uh, I would be pleased to answer any remaining questions that you may have. Um, I know that I ran through the material relatively quickly. So if there are any clarification questions or anything else, I'd be pleased to answer that now. Okay, our first question is why does DBRS Morningstar require assumed maturity greater than five years to get any equity treatment? Good question. Permanence is an important characteristic of common equity that provides a cushion for senior debt holders in challenging times. We believe this cushion should be in place for a sufficient time as the issuer deals with any tough times it may be going through. So it would be able to use that hybrid security to, for example, defer interest payments for up to five years without causing a default of that instrument or any cross default. So we believe that there should be a significant amount of maturity remaining or time remaining to use that feature to get equity treatment. The second question is why is the replacement language so important to the equity analysis or sorry, equity treatment analysis? Well, as we know, there is a significant probability that the optional redemption will be exercised at the end of the non-call period, non-call five or non-call 10. In that case, we want to see the above noted or the previously noted uh, equity cushion maintained. So for example, even though there's a chance that that 10 year uh, instrument will be redeemed at 10 years, we can still consider it to be an equity cushion if the issuer intends to issue something of equal or greater equity value uh, at that time. So as to maintain that equity cushion beyond the date of that first non-call or first call, I should say. Um, so that's why we are looking at uh, having a certain buffer of time prior, uh, prior to the instrument being taken out and also it being uh, for, in order for it to get any kind of equity treatment. Okay, so I have another question here is, um, I noted that hybrid securities have been issued with more frequency recently than preferred shares and why is that the case? Another good question. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, a lot of the preferred shares that were issued in recent years were rate reset preferred shares so that every five years the, the, the instrument would be set at a new rate that was and in the investor's hopes, higher. But of course, that's a different perspective from the issuer's um, intent, um, hopes or expectations. So in the current environment, you're seeing that when some of these preferred shares come up to the rate reset period, and the expectation is that the coupon rate will be higher now under the preferred shares, the instrument is that the preferred share instruments are now being taken out with hybrid preferred shares or sorry, hybrid securities to replace the instrument. Um, I'm sure a big part of that is, is related to the cost. Uh, rather than locking in a higher preferred share coupon for the next five years, the company would prefer to issue a lower coupon, uh, although be it, albeit higher than the senior unsecured notes uh, now, and then deal with that again in 10 years or 
the first non-call coming up. I believe that's the logical reason at this point for that trend that we're seeing. Who knows, maybe in the future that'll change, but given where we see interest rates going right now, which is up, uh, that's, that's likely to be a continuing trend at this point. Thank you for your time. I appreciate that. Um, please submit any feedback you may have in the rating box below the present, uh, with respect to the presentation as we value your input for future sessions. Thank you for your time. Bye.